March 29th. Sometimes I wonder if my father will ever grow up. Take the day when this all started, for instance. When I got home from school, I heard this his excited voice rattling out of the study, going a mile a minute, obviously not listening too closely to the person on the other end of the phone, because whoever it was couldn't have gotten a word in sideways. I wondered why he was home from work so early. There was He was in his chair behind his desk, leaning back so far that you'd swear he was going to go over backwards like a slapstick comedian. With the phone wedged between his shoulder and his neck, yakking away while he tried to tear and open an envelope, probably so he could read his mail while he was talking. Then later he'd probably get what was in the mail and was what was on the phone mixed up. My dad. Yeah, he said breathlessly into the phone. Just got the assignment today. What? You bet I'm excited. He was, too. I could tell from his eyes that something big was going on. His eyes were bright blue like mine, and when his turned on to something, they sort of danced. They were rocking and rolling today, all right. It could be the start of something really, really important over there, he went on. I turned him out and looked at the mess on the floor. The study there was a new sunny beta, beta cam just unpacked from the carton. It looked like Dad had torn open the carton in a fit of rage. There were squares and oblongs of white styrofoam lying all over, along with clear plastic bags, twist ties, and tons of these styrofoam bits that Dad called plastic mouse droppings. But it was just his usual method of unpacking, rip and tear until you find what's inside. Then my eye caught another smaller box, ripped open but not emptied. I looked inside. It was a camcorder, the kind tourists and proud mommies who want to take the pictures of their kids' birthday parties by. You'd never believe it to look at him now. His lanky form splayed out in the chair, light brown eyes, brown hair in a mess. Shirt wrinkled, jeans creased, but my dad is one of those top news cameramen in the country. I'm really proud of him, although I wouldn't tell him that. He works for the CBC, and he's won a couple of awards, like the time he just got, or like the time he just about got killed videotaping the capture of a gang of bank robbers who had gotten stuck in a traffic on the Gardner Expressway. Long ago, that long ago, I realized that it was my dad's childish, no childlike he always says, personality that makes him such a great cameraman. It is ri crazy risk-taking that makes his work extra special. But sometimes I wish he'd realize that there are other things in the world than cameras and film and lenses and video cassettes. I wonder how Dad scored a new back beta cam. I thought as he chattered away into the phone, right, it's been 30 years since the break with lots of conflict in the meantime this will be a really big story his voice faded as i left the study he had finally noticed me from behind the pile of papers and stacks of files and collections of moldy coffee mugs on his desk and waved so i left the room i knew that i'd get a full rundown of the conversation whether i wanted it or not later on so i went downstairs to the basement I flipped on the light and was struck by the stern faces of a few dozen soldiers staring at me. They were lined up in a ceremonial formation, soldiers from an ancient army. They stood erect and proud on a piece of thick plywood, and I looked at them from the doorway, scanning the lines of miniature men, looking for a flaw in the deployment of their ranks. A tiny lead soldier's tunic painted the wrong color, a bowman kneeling on the wrong knee. I knew I'd find no flaws, but I looked the soldiers over anyway. There wasn't a whole army, of course, only three dozen miniature men, and one war chariot of four horses, with four horses. I had made every one of them from molds. I fashioned myself, then, uh, fashioned myself, then handed painted each one carefully. Sorry, let me go back there, guys. I had made every one of them from molds I fashioned myself, and then hand-painted each one carefully so as to get the detail perfect. There were six months 
research and then a year's work of casting, finishing, and painting. Now the display was almost re ready. This was my most ambitious project. I had been a nut about all aspects of the military history for a long, long time. I had model planes hanging on threads from my bedroom ceiling. Three tanks guarded my dresser. An armored personnel character carrier defended my desk. And in the basement were stored boxes of tin soldiers, along with Leo's plans for battles. I had done the Charge of the Light Brigade, the Battle of Frog Lake, and Riel Rebellion, the Plains of Abraham, naturally, Yan Bien Phu, and more. I had won lots of trophies from exhibitions put on by hobbyists all around Ontario, but this one was going to be the best anybody had ever done, I hoped. I got the idea from a TV show I saw about two years ago. It was some kind of documentary on Chinese history, and it concentrated on the burial site near Xi'an, ancient capital in northwest China. The first emperor of China, Queen Sheng Hong, is buried under a huge tumulus. That's a tomb hidden under a man-made mountain. The Qing dynasty was in power from 221 to 207 BC, and the King Sheng Hong, the founder, was the emperor who built the Great Wall of China. Actually, he linked together a lot of walls that were there before he came to the throne. The Chinese still ha haven't opened the Tulumus yet. Anyway, about a click and a half from the Tulumus, a farmer was plowing the ground one day, struggling along with his mule or ox or whatever. And he looked down and saw the top of somebody's head. Turned out it was the head of a life-size model of a soldier made from terracotta clay. But that's not the interesting part. The interesting part is that there was a whole army of these clay soldiers buried in the three different sites. The site was the farmer found had more than 500 soldiers and six war chariots, each with four horses. There were three phalanxes, each with an honor guard of 70 men, and the soldiers were buried standing up in ceremonial formation facing the tumulus. The books I read about uh, this said that the soldiers were lined up as if to protect the tumulus from desecration, but I'm sure that's dead wrong. It has to be. You don't face towards what you're defending. Any fool knows that. You face away from what you're defending. You face the enemy. The more I read about these terracotta soldiers, the more fascinated I got, and each one is made with great detail. You can take out the small squares in the armor, or the armor is made of the studs that hold the squares to the backing, the folds of cloth and the scars and the long coats, even the hair of their mustaches and beards. There are officers enlisted, you can tell from the cloth, clothing and armor. Bowmen, spear bearers, horsemen, they were all clunky looking for looking square shoes. Sorry, they all wear clunky looking square shoes. All that got me readings, other stuff about Chinese history, wars, and battles. The most famous book and the hardest to read was Art of War by Sun Ji. Great stuff. Then I got the idea of building a display based on the Xi'an site and entering it in an exhibition. I was now way ahead of schedule. The show wasn't until the end of June. I walked over to the display and sat down on the stool behind the display. Facing me were six men who had not been painted. I turned my de desk lamp on and got to work, but I didn't get much done. The banging of the basement door and the thump of footsteps on the stairs told me that my dad was finished with the telephone. The lens of a beta cam appeared in the doorway, then a phony TV announcer vo voice droned. And here is the famed military historian, 17-year-old Canadian Alexander Jackson, hard at work, deep in the damp catacombs of his home in Toronto. My dad moved into the room slowly. The new beta cam perched on his shoulder. The lens zoomed in and out. Tell us, Alex, said my father. How? Cut it out, will you, Dad? I'm trying to concentrate. He lowered the beta cam. A mile-wide grin was plastered on his face. He picked up one of the unpainted soldiers and looked at it, and then stared straight into my eyes. His eyes bounced and danced. How would you like, he said barely able to contain his excitement to see those guys close up. I mean, really close up. How would you like to stand on the tomb of Emperor King Sheng Wing? King Xing Huang, Dad. Yeah, him. How would you like to stand on his tumulus 
and look at the place where these guys lived. Come on, Dad, get real. We'd have to go to right. We'd have to go to China. Dad and I were sitting at the kitchen table drinking tea. I had hastily put away my paints, and he was filling me in on a meeting he had had with his boss earlier that afternoon. It was hard to follow sometimes because when he was excited, he rushed around inside his own sentences, starting thoughts and leaving them unfinished as he jumped over to new ones. But what I had gathered so far was that the CBC cameraman assigned to Beijing had come home with hepatitis. That's a liver disease. He didn't want to be treated in the Chinese hospitals. And who can blame him, Dad added. So he came home, and now there was a correspondent in Beijing without a cameraman. Dad said that the Russian premier, Gorbachev, was making an official visit to Beijing, the capital of China, in May. Jack, Dad's boss, wanted to, go, wanted to send Dad to replace the sick guy. He wanted Dad to go to China soon to do a lot of background stuff. And Jack had an instinct with, that this story would be bigger than just the state visit. All good newsmen and women trust their hunches almost as much as their sources, Dad's added. So, Dad finished up in a long, convoluted sentence. Jack asked me if I wanted to go. I said yes. He issued me with a new beta camera, or beta cam, and I went out and picked up a little camcorder for our own use because on the way home, after we've done work in the center kingdom, the middle kingdom, Dad, I knew he made goofs like that just to kid me, and I hated to disappoint him by letting them go. Yeah, whatever. And on the way home, we can flip over to CM. Yeah, okay, see Yan. Don't look at me like that and take some footage of your pals, who you've been standing under all that dirt for almost 2,000 years, waiting for you to come and see them. What do you say? I could hardly believe it. China? 7,000 years of history? I'd miss the military history exhibition this spring, but there would be another in Hamilton in the fall. What about school, Dad? I might lose my year if I go now. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. Well, I'll call the principal and fix it. You've got pretty good marks, right? Yeah, I'm doing all right, but I'd have to miss exams. Or we will just be back before school gets out? Doubt it. We might be there for months. Could be tense, Dad. I don't know if they'd let me go. They'll have to. I'll tell them that we have no choice. I thought for a moment. I knew I had to work this through, cover all the bases. If I left it up to my dad, he'd just pack us up and we'd go. They might say that I could live with mom and finish my year there. They know she lives in Toronto. He scowled. You want to live with her while I'm gone? Of course not, dad, I said hastily. I'm just staying, saying that might be what the principal will say. Well, I'll take care of that. Where are you going to learn the most? Sitting at a desk and doing busy work? or traveling across the world. You don't have to convince me, Dad. Leave it to me, Alex. I'll charm that principal right out of his socks. What's his name, anyway? He's a she, Dad. Whatever. And he did. I have three courses this semester. My French teacher gave me an estimated mark, a B. My computer science, te science teacher let me do a special project that took me a week of slugging to complete co to complete to make up for the stuff I'd miss. And my history teacher, Mr. Bronsky, who likes me because I'm a history nut like him, let me go on with an A as long as I keep a deep travel of my diary of my experiences and hand it in to him when I get back. I started it tonight, after Dad came home and told me all the arrangements. There's only one wrinkle, he added. What? What? Why is it? I thought that things never just work out nice and neat. Well, Jack says, the assignment might be a little longer than expected. Apparently, the guy who got hepatitis is out of commission for a while. How much of a while, Dad? Well, maybe a year. A year? That's your idea of a little bit longer? I thought our plan was to be out of Beijing by the end of May, then go to Xi'an for a week or so, and then come home. A year? No way, Dad. Why don't we just see how it goes? Play it by year. My dad is the only person in the universe who would fly half her way around the world, stay a bit, and see how it goes. Sometimes he drives me nuts. Play it by ear means not having a clue what we're doing next. No plans, no schedules, just floating along. I hate that. I mean, things should be organized. Dad, 
I can't live there for a year. I, I just can't. Okay, let's make a deal. We'll cover Gorbachev's visit, do the follow-up, then go to Sheehan. Then we'll see if one of us wants to come home at that point. We will. Okay, Dad. He smiled, and his eyes sparkled as he pushed his long hair out of his eyes. I felt a lot better once we had things settled. So here I am, scribbling away like crazy, hardly able to write for excitement, because we leave tomorrow.